All right, wonderful. So it's just two minutes after one o'clock Pacific time. I'm here in Vancouver at the Vancouver Aquarium today. And I would like to welcome all of our audience members. I'd like to welcome Julie, our presenter today, who's going to share some wonderful information about humpback whales that will blow your mind today. And I'd like to say how grateful I am to live, teach, and learn on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. And it's from incorporating those best practices of looking after the land so that the land can look after us that really informs how we shape programs like today's Tales from the Deep Insights from OceanWise Research as well as all the work that we do here at OceanWise in conservation research and education. And so we're so excited to have Julie, Julie joining us today. And so I'd like to turn it over to her to start her presentation and I'll hand over the presenter ability for screen sharing. Perfect. All right, so hello, Danica in Vancouver. I am actually presenting today from Prince Rupert, which is fun. So I'm very far up north, and I am presenting on the traditional territory of the Potsdamshin peoples, uh, which is, I'm so incredibly happy to be here. It is a beautiful place to live and learn and research, and I'm excited to tell you all about the stuff that we'll be doing. Right, should be good. Okay, so as I mentioned, my name is Julie and I am a research assistant for the North Coast Cetacean Research Initiative, which is part of the Marine Mammal Research and Conservation Team here at OceanWise. And we will be talking about humpbacks and humpback research that will blow your mind. <laughs> so first things first, I want to clarify something about what a blow is, because I know there are some misconceptions about that. So when a whale comes to the surface, uh, it basically exhales a whole bunch of air all at once, and that is what a blow is. So when the warm air from the humpback comes up and hits the cool air outside, it condenses and it creates this very distinctive kind of white cloud shape. And for all of the cetaceans that are kind of here in BC that are fairly common, humpback blows tend to be pretty tall and also very columnar, sort of pillar shaped, which is important. We'll get to that in a little bit. Hello <laughs> today. There we go. Okay, so <laughs> North Coast Station Research Initiative, our field season uh, this year was kind of summer and fall, and our field crew consisted of myself, as well as Karina Draycott and our Ocean Ambassador, Sydney Long, and the North Coast Station Research Initiative also has another member, Bronwyn Harvey, who is remote down south on Vancouver Island, which is super. And of course, we can't forget our boat, the Sitka. Very, very wonderful. The North Coast Station Research Initiative was established in 2014 and has four main goals. Uh, so the first one is to monitor cetacean populations. And as a reminder, cetacean refers to all of whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So we monitor cetacean populations in the region through field research and citizen science. We conduct applied research projects to learn more about locally important species and at-risk species. We develop tools to affect conservation and engage targeted groups and the community, which includes you. Now into the meat of the presentation, we'll be covering humpback whales, which are super, super great. I have a wonderful humpback over here, really lovely. So humpback whales, their scientific name is Neoptera novae angliae, which I probably just mispronounced. Uh, but the important part of that name is the genus Megaptera. So mega comes from the word that means large, and pteron is a word that means wing. So the humpback whales are actually named for their very large flippers. 
Effects have the largest flipper to body ratio compared to any other cetacean. Their flippers are about a third of their total body length. And considering they're about 12 meters ish in length, that means their flippers are about 13 feet long, which is huge. Uh, so their flippers are about the height of two fridges stacked on top of each other. Or if you had two twin size beds kind of like back to back, it's about that length as well. So when you go to sleep tonight on your bed, you think I am laying down on something that is half the length of a humpback flipper. Now, humpback flippers are highly flexible and very mobile. And you'll notice on kind of that leading edge there, there are some big bumps. Those are called tubercles. And in a study conducted by Frank Fish and colleagues, they actually found that the tubercles on a whale's flipper allows or rather alters water flow over the flipper, which decreases drag and increases lift. And this allows them to be very agile under the water and out of the water as well. More fun facts about humpbacks. So we already kind of talked about their blows, which is one of the ways you can kind of identify them from afar. And they're very large flippers. Their tubercles they can have on their flippers, but they can also have on their jaw as well as their head. They tend to be black or very dark colored on top dorsally, and then they have some white on the bottom or ventrally. They also can have white on their flippers and on their flukes, which we will talk about a lot. So flukes are their tail fins, basically. Humpbacks are very heavy. <laughs> they weigh about 40,000 kilograms. Uh, so huge, huge animals. Uh, to put this into perspective, they weigh about the same as six and a half T-Rexes or Trinosaurus Rexes. So if you thought a T-Rex was big, humpbacks are way bigger. Um, also, I've heard of the dorsal fin. So their dorsal fin is kind of perched up on a hump of tissue, hence the name humpback. They are, as I mentioned, around 12 meters long, so between 11.9 meters for males and 12.3 meters for females. So there's some sexual dimorphism happening there. And their length is most commonly compared to the length of a school bus. They're pretty big. Uh, if you don't like school buses, they're about three Volkswagen Beetles long. Or if you prefer an animal comparison, they're about the length of two giraffes. Their lifespan is unknown, but likely around 80 years. Um, another thing to note, you'll see kind of like some lines on the bottom part of the humpback. Those are ventral rope leads, which you see very well in this picture here. Uh, so those ventral throat pleats go from their chin to around their navel region. Uh, you can also see the tubercles along their jaw. Sometimes humpbacks have barnacles growing on them and on their tubercles, and those barnacles can get very large. Humpbacks also have baleen, which is a pretty good example from the baleen that I have here. Uh, they have between 270 and 400 plates of baleen on each side of their mouth, and they use them to feed. So oh, humpbacks <laughs> are gulp eaters. So that basically means they take really huge mouthfuls that are full of concentrated prey and water. And they use their baleen. So they sip the water out through the baleen and then their prey is kind of like, and they use their tongue to kind of eat it or swallow it down. They primarily eat things like krill or bees or copepods or different schooling fish. You can kind of see a little fish in that picture there. Uh, up here they eat things like Pacific herring and Pacific sand lance. They have a lot of different ways of eating. So you can find them all over from inshore, outer coastal, the continental shelf or offshore habitats. And they'll do things like lunge feeding or flick feeding, as well as some of the famous behaviors like bubble net feeding. <laughs> so, something to note, bubble net feeding, not all humpbacks bubble net feed, uh, but the ones up in the northeast of Pacific do, and there's group bubble net feeding, which can consist of about five to ten whales, could be a little bit less, could be a little bit more, uh, and they can also bubble net feed by themselves, which is kind of cool. So, when they're bubble net feeding in a group, essentially what will happen is a whole bunch of humpbacks will kind of dive in unison, and then they'll swim in a really big circle and one humpback will blow a whole bunch of bubbles and that circle will get smaller and smaller, which kind of is thought to condense the prey or the fish into a bit of a tighter ball. And then they will all in unison kind of come up all at once with their mouths agape and take huge mouthfuls of those fish and water all together. And that's also part of why those ventral pleats are really useful because when they open their mouths, it is 
Right. Humpbacks are also known to be migratory. Now you can see humpbacks all year round here in BC, which is pretty amazing. We actually got to see a whole bunch of humpbacks yesterday. <laughs> so that was really cool. Uh, but typically humpbacks are known to move between kind of cold productive feeding areas in the summer to warmer subtropical and tropical breeding grounds in the winter. Uh, and in a study conducted by Splash in 2004 and 2006, which was one of the large whale studies ever attempted, uh, one of the things they found was that humpbacks have strong site fidelity with respect to their feeding and breeding regions. This basically means that humpbacks like to return to the same place year after year after year. So humpbacks that we identify here in the Chatham Sound are typically also identified in Hawaii, which is fun. I mean, I also like Hawaii, so. That's great. Now, why humpbacks migrate is debated. It could be because that way, when they're in warmer waters, they don't have to expend as much energy to keep warm. So it benefits them thermodynamically. Um, now, this is great for all the humpbacks, but especially for the calves. <laughs> Listen, calves don't have quite as much insulation as the adults, so it works out for them pretty well. Uh, but they could also be in warmer waters to help the calves avoid predation. Now, calves are predated on sometimes by sharks, but mainly by big killer whales or transient killer whales. And I've got that T breaks its A's in this picture. Uh, so killer whales, and especially these ones, they tend to be concentrated more highly in colder waters. So there's not as many um, killer whales in those warmer regions. Now, adults don't really have to, you know, worry about being predated on by killer whales because adult humpbacks are pretty big. They've got really powerful flukes and flippers, but the calves, not so much. Uh, so calves, we can tell that they've been attacked by killer whales because when they grow up, right, when they're little as well, they end up with these rake marks. Uh, and so this leads really well into our identification section of the presentation. Uh, so humpback whales, identifying them by the individual is primarily done by looking at the undersides of their flukes. Uh, and so you can see very well from these two whales, the top one is fox size and the bottom one is ricochet. They've got some very prominent rake marks on their flukes. And Ricochet in particular has a really good <laughs> bite mark there. Uh, so they were both attacked as calves by big killer whales. This is the same with the top whale staff and the bottom one bear claw. They've also got some very prominent rake marks there. Uh, but rake marks aren't the only kinds of scars that humpbacks can get. Uh, so we talked about how humpbacks can have barnacles on them. Again, really large. Uh, they can get barnacles on their flukes, and then when the barnacles fall off, they end up leaving these kind of circular little barnacle scars, like you can see in the top whale Barney and the bottom whale Bubbles. But they don't always have a whole bunch of barnacle scars, kind of like this lovely whale, Amoeba. Humpbacks can also have, I mean, from what we see, different kind of shapes and patterns in their flukes. Uh, now, I've mentioned some humpback names already, and I just want to point out that all of the humpbacks in BC and off our coast, they each have an individual alphanumeric identifier, like the top one is BCZ UKNC 2015 underscore 03, and the bottom one is BCY0428. <laughs> but when you're in the field trying to remember who's who, and when you're sorting through a whole bunch of fluke photos in the lab, those names are a little bit hard to remember which is why we come up with these nicknames for the humpbacks that are based on more noticeable characteristics in their flukes. Like the top one, we nickname mouse, which you can kind of see the whole fluke looks like a mouse, but also that like black kind of spot near the middle indeed also looks like a mouse. And then the bottom one, we nickname Portobello. Sometimes the features are smaller, like in the top flute, you can see a little eight, hence crazy eight. And for those of you that like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the bottom one is named Raphael. Sometimes they have letters, like the top one has a little K in the right corner, hence special K. And the bottom one is nicknamed Eel, who was very popular last year. Sometimes the patterns are remarkable. <laughs> So this whale is pretty cool. This one is named Gandalf. 
And if you look in the center bottom of its fluke, that black shape there looks astonishingly like Gandalf. Up back to their alphanumeric codes, uh, they're grouped into three main categories. Uh, so you've got the Z whales, the Y whales, and the X whales. And Zs, Ys, and Xs are based on how much white they have on the underside of their fluke. So Z whales have a lot of white, uh, like the top one Wally and the bottom one Winter. Uh, tends to be between 80 to 100 percent white. The wild whales kind of vary, so they could go from a fair bit of white, like dragon face up top and Dundee underneath, to not as much white. Uh, the top one, Bear, who's a very big whale, and the bottom one, Archipelago, who we saw yesterday, which was super cool. So, Archipelago and Winter Whales. And then the X whales are kind of tricky because they don't really have any white at all. or at least not very much. Uh, so the top one we have nicknamed Bubble Net Bob. That's a solo bubble net feeder who we actually saw earlier in the presentation. And then the bottom one is Rugged. Very rugged oil. Now, even though these groupings, that Y and X seem pretty useful, sometimes it's still tricky because the amount of white can change. Uh, so these two pictures, the top and the bottom, they look like different whales because the white percentage is different. However, they are the same. The difference is about 15 years. <laughs> so we have this whale, Lazy Eye. It went from having a lot of white to not a lot of white. You can also identify them by individually uh, based on their fluke shape. So the top one, Underbite, has that kind of chop out of the bottom right side. We also saw Underbite yesterday. Uh, and then the bottom one, Dobby, the whole fluke kind of looks like a little sock. Uh, the top one here, PETA, has kind of a big notch, and then the bottom chomp has a piece missing off of its left fluke. Some of them have very deep bees, like wings up top. Some of them not so much, kind of flat, a little bit like cherub. But even the shape could be a little confusing uh, because depending on your photography skills or how well your camera is focusing at the time, uh, when you're looking at pictures, sometimes the flukes, even if they're the same whale, like this one, the tic tac look different because of the angle that the photo is taken. So the tried and true best method of identifying whales is by looking at their trailing edge. So the trailing edge is that edge along the very top of the fluke. Sometimes it can have a whole bunch of little pointy bits like Batman. Sometimes it's pretty flat like tight. Occasionally you'll get little shapes like the top one has kind of bunny ears or there's a hook in the bottom fluke there. Uh, occasionally you have a really big notch, like double scoop, and then the bottom Morse code has a very identifiable trailing edge. Now, all of the whales that we have identified up here in Chatham Sound have been put into a wonderful catalog, which you can find online. It's super awesome. It has whales from historic data all the way back to 2001, the data that we've collected in the field up until 2020. And currently our database has 280 whales and counting. So there are very many whales, and that's just in this region. The catalog was a very big group effort, so I just want to say thank you to the Prince Rupert Adventure Tours, Met Palace Stewardship Society, and Prince Rupert Fisheries Officers for support. There are a lot of individual photographers as well that helped with acquiring historic data and other you know, group photos, locations, and sighting dates. In addition to our own catalog, there are also a whole bunch of other catalogs along the coast. And there's now an NGO-led province-wide catalog underway after the coast-wide effort by DFO was suspended in 2013. So the hope is to have a draft of this catalog by 2021 for whales all up and down the coast. Now, why do we catalog? I mean, aside from it's really cool to see all of the different whales. <laughs> so cataloging and monitoring individuals uh, uses a market recapture approach to contribute to larger studies with respect to distribution and population assessments. Uh, so being able to identify them individually helps figure out how many whales there are, and then it also kind of helps us figure out where they are on the coast and mark different hotspots and things like that. Helps us understand movement uh, like within Chatham Sound, but also within DC as a whole, and helps us understand uh, fill in those gaps around migration, especially for the late fall and winter whales, kind of like the ones we saw yesterday. Uh, we also have been working with Southeast Alaska. 
uh, to learn more about site fidelity. So remember that's when whales kind of return to the same spot over and over. And we've been able to identify matching mother calf pairs. So the whale in this photo has been nicknamed Jumping Jack. And it was found through collaboration that Jumping Jack is indeed the calf of Aurora. So cute. We've also been doing larger collaborations as well um, with a project led by Ted Cheeseman for Happy Whale. Happy Whale has a matching algorithm that is incredibly high matching rate based off a data set that includes over 23,000 individuals. Uh, so we've been able to submit 174 whales to Happy Whale and of those submitted, 81 of them were matched. And of the 81 matched, it was found that 54 of those whales were sighted in Hawaii, including this whale, Shock. Now, all of these things are really cool. We can learn all kinds of things about humpbacks through matching and ID. Uh, but why do we want to learn more about humpbacks? You know, what makes them so amazing? Um, I might be able to convince you by showing you a picture of this whale, BCYUKNC201702, otherwise known as SIA. Humpback whales are very famously known for their acrobatic abilities. <laughs> So humpbacks, I mean, we love them, right? They're huge, they breach, they, you know, make cool sounds, they sing, um, they're incredibly agile, they're just really fun, and we just love humpbacks in general because they're just cool, you know? They're amazing. But we also want to learn more about humpbacks and, uh, you know, find out ways that we can help them because back in the 19th and 20th century, especially, uh, humpbacks were hunted during the commercial humpback whaling, uh, and it wasn't until about 1967 that the last commercial whaling station actually closed in BC. So this the humpback population took a really, really huge hit, and it was rare to see humpbacks even into the early 1980s. Thankfully, since then, since the 1980s, they've been steadily kind of increasing, which is great. Uh, and due to abundance and current upward trend, their status was actually downlisted from threatened to special concern under Sarah in 2014. But that does not mean that there are still not threats that humpbacks face. Uh, so with a whole bunch more humpbacks, there's also a lot more boats on the water. And so humpbacks, um, in addition to other things, they're also susceptible to stuff like noise pollution from sonar and shipping traffic and other things that may mask their commu commu yeah, communication. <laughs> and humpbacks, kind of like this one, BCZ, you can see 2015 one otherwise known as Mango, um, are susceptible to things like entanglement in fishing gear. Uh, so there are probably a whole lot more humpbacks that are entangled in fishing gear than we actually realize because many of them may go unnoticed. Um, and they are evidenced by uh, different markings either on their fluke, or you can see with Mango in that bottom picture there around its tail stock, there's clear indication that it was entangled. In addition to entanglement, humpbacks are also susceptible and at highest risk of mortality and injury from vessel strikes. So you can see that prop mark. Um, this is also mangle um, on the right side of the whale. Uh, humpbacks are the second most struck whale globally. And of the reported strike incidents in BC, they are the most struck whale. So when we monitor individuals and you know, do all of that cataloging and identification, um, it can help us understand these fluctuations in distribution, what areas might be important, how their population is doing, and in turn, that can help us assess threats and design effective mitigation measures to help their population. Now, maybe when you look at the ocean, that big, beautiful blue ocean, you think, you know, how back to great and all, but they're not really my thing, which I don't understand, but that's okay. We could still be friends. <laughs> maybe to you, you would rather learn about stellar sea lions. Or perhaps you're more of a sea otter person, you know, you just really love Joey and all of the super fuzzy animals. Or maybe you really, really love jellies, which I get it, they're super cool. Or maybe you love anemones, they're super fun, or, but you know, only the green ones. Or maybe you're one of those rare people who just really appreciate and love chitons. <laughs> that is okay too. Even if whales aren't your thing, you should still care about whales. They're still important, especially for all of these other animals because everything is so connected and whales are so important in their ecosystems. Um, one of the ways this is exemplified is through the whale pump. Uh, so when whales dive down deep, deep into the ocean and they eat their food um, and you know get all of that prey and nutrients, when they come up to the surface, they poop at the surface. 
everybody does it. It's a thing. <laughs> so whale poop actually has a whole bunch of nutrients in it. Uh, and so they basically do the system. They're bringing nutrients from deep in the ocean, bringing it to the surface, and then all of those nutrients in that cycling that's happening is helping to uh, be all like the plankton, all of the microalgae and the food plankton, and then that feeds the bigger animals, and then that feeds the bigger animals, and that feeds the bigger animals, and then you know, you end up with this very, very rich, rich ecosystem that whales are a big part of. Uh, whales are also really important uh, when we think about things like climate change. Whales are huge, obviously, that's been mentioned before. But with that, they're able to store a whole bunch of carbon inside of them. So they're a really big carbon sink. And then when they die, they go down to the bottom. So they uh, in a process called whale fall. And so they're taking that carbon and bringing it down where it gets stored. But on top of that, they're also helping to feed a whole bunch of really deep kind of more benthic organisms as well, like lots of cool sharks and um, other organisms that specifically feed on whale bones and all kinds of things. So even if you don't care about whales that much, you should care about whales anyway, because they are so important to so many other things in the ocean. OK, so we all care about whales. We all think that they're super amazing. That's great. What can we do though, right? How can we help these whales? Um, so I'm just gonna mention a few things that you can do. One of them, so the Marine Education and Research Society has started a campaign called See a Blow, Go Slow. Um, a lot of the strips, the ship strikes that happened in BC involving humpbacks uh, happen with small vessels that are traveling very fast or more than 15 miles. When you're out on the water, if you're on a boat and you see one of those very distinctive columnar blows that kind of like white poofy cloud, make sure to slow down. <laughs> it's very important. And if you do encounter a whale strike or if you strike a whale, make sure it is reported. It is also something very important. Another thing you can do if you are out to see whales specifically is you can actually see whales from land, which is cool. So you could look up the whale trail BC. That's something you can do. Another thing you can do to help the whales is to report your sightings to the BC Cetacean Sightings Network. Uh, so there is a very handy dandy whale report app. I have it myself and used it a whole bunch yesterday uh, where you can report your cetacean sightings. So that's not just humpbacks, that's humpbacks, dolphins, horses. Um, you can also report turtles too, if you happen to see a turtle. Uh, but either way, you can report your sightings on the app. You can also call in your sightings. There's a web form online and you can email in your sightings. Um, and then that contributes to a database that we have that goes towards all kinds of different studies. And it's used in things like creating marine protection areas and all kinds of stuff like that. So reporting your sightings is really helpful. More broad scale, maybe you don't live by the ocean. I mean, this presentation is online, so you could be from anywhere. Um, you could do a shoreline cleanup. Uh, remember, pretty much all of our garbage and plastic eventually is somehow connected to the ocean. Uh, so you can do a shoreline cleanup along the beach, along the ocean, but you can also do a shoreline cleanup along a river, a lake, or around a storm drain and get rid of some of that debris, plastic, maybe you can pick up some fishing gear or line, uh, and then that will help to kind of eliminate a lot of that waste. And in general, you can do all kinds of other things. There's a lot of different ways that you can get involved and kind of help whales specifically, but also the ocean at large by being ocean wise. So you can go to ocean.org and learn about a whole bunch of other ways that you can get involved there. Uh, before I end my presentation, I would like to thank you, our supporters from industry, so our industry partners, in addition to our government funding bodies, and especially um, supporting the humpback research that NCTRI does through the Coastal Environmental Baseline Program. Next. All right, if you want to learn more about the North Coast Cetacean Research Initiative, and I'm going to put all of this in the chat in a minute. Um, you can go to wildwhale.org, our website. You can email us at northcoast.ocean.org. You can call us if you would like, pretty old school. Find us on Facebook at Marine Mammal Research Program, Instagram at OceanWise Research. All right, that is my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. I learned so much. And those were fantastic photos. I am just, well, blown away, as you promised, by how good those were. I could only imagine. 
seeing uh, whales like that um, so beautifully. So thank you for sharing those with us. Uh, we have lots of great questions coming in the chat from our audience today. And I think one of the first questions that came through is regarding those amazing photos that you shared with us. Um, so kind of what what kind of camera do you need in order to be able to take a photo like that? Um, and for those fluke ID photos, it must happen pretty quickly. So how fast with a camera do you have to be? All right, so actually, if you give me one second, I can show you my camera. <laughs> Excellent. I'm excited to see some of the tech behind those photos. So getting those photos definitely does not happen with an iPhone. <laughs> that would be crazy. No, instead we have cameras like this. <laughs> so this camera here has a 500 millimeter zoom lens. It is crazy long uh, and quite heavy, especially if you're holding it for a long period of time. <laughs> so camera that has incredible zoom uh, and shutter speed typically pretty quick. I think yesterday my shutter speed was set to around 2000 ish. And then it also helps when you're good at cropping photos. <laughs> so a lot of those photos are also cropped sometimes quite a fair bit uh, so that it looks like it's a lot closer than it is. Uh, but we're actually a lot of time quite far away. <laughs> it's just we have pretty fancy zoom lenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I think that's a great insight, kind of almost like a before and after one day to share with us for what those photos look maybe before they're cropped nice and up close like that. Um, <laughs> exactly. And are you taking these photos um, from a boat or on the shoreline most of the time? Another question was, um, is there any work tagging these animals or do you track it purely all through the photos that you take? Uh, so most of the time, like us up here with the North Coast Fish Initiative, we are taking photos from our vessel, the Sitica, which is a very small little boat, a little smaller than 25 feet. Um, it's very great and zippy. <laughs> uh, but we can't go out in super crazy weather, so we're often very restricted by weather. Um, especially in the winter season, like yesterday when we went out uh, to go look for some whales and get those photo identification shots, see who was around in the winter. Um, we actually chartered a company because they had a bigger boat, so we could go out in kind of those bigger swells um, that we normally can't get out in. Uh, you definitely can get really good pictures of whales from land. Um, we don't normally do that unless they're kind of in the harbor, but a lot of the time the whales in Chatham Sound are kind of up quite a bit further north, like around. I have a good chart over here. Actually, wait, okay, this map here, this chart rather, that's kind of Chatham Sound. It is very big and some of the whales are sometimes very spread out. So um, there was one day we traveled, I think it was over like 130 kilometers in one day. Um, just getting out to the different areas in Chatham Sound. So, yeah, we can go pretty far, but you can get really good pictures from land. And there are a lot of places where whales do come quite close to shore. So, very, very cool. And I'm sorry, I rambled and I forgot the other part of that question. <laughs> um, I think that covered it really well, like the, okay. the oceans <laughs> and, you know, taking it from land or in the boat. And I think it's so great to hear from our audience that they've clearly been watching some of our other tales from the deep because there's lots of questions coming in about whether you ever would get the opportunity to use drones for some of your photos, like our work with the killer whales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we are doing a whole lot of drone activity right now, especially because it's crazy bumpy on the water. Um, but we are hoping to do more drone activity like down south, um, but probably in this coming year, in the summer would be my guess. Um, I believe Karina Draycott, who is also with the North Coast Station Research Initiative, is 
uh, on today in the chat. So perhaps she would also be able to answer that a little bit more in depth. I am looking at our drone across the office right now. So we do have one. <laughs> it is something that's in the works. It's just not quite as developed as is down south at the moment, but hopefully soon in the future. <laughs> Excellent. We'll just have to invite you back for another Tales from the Deep to share some of that new footage with us. Um, I also, there's lots of questions connected to the migration of these animals. Uh, the first one being kind of how many of these whales stay in the north or migrate. I think you touched on that a little bit earlier in your presentation as well as have you noticed any changes to migration patterns and what might cause that? Um, so one thing to note about the whales migrating south is a lot of them do it at different times. So like there will be maybe like some that, you know, come up to like the Chatham Sound area in like April, May, and then maybe they leave a bit earlier. Or, um, sometimes there's like a group that are kind of around July, August, or um, once you kind of start getting like September, there's like different like fall kind of whales. And so um, they don't necessarily migrate all at once. Um, and the other thing to note too is I remember reading um, once about how in the breeding grounds, it's also a little bit different in that there tends to be more males hanging out in the breeding grounds for longer periods than the females. Like the females won't necessarily stay there as long. Um, so you also have a little bit of difference there. Um, I mean, it may be in part because then the males have more opportunity to breed or, you know, there could be a lot of factors, but either way, the males largely outnumber the females in the breeding grounds. Um, and then as far as winter whales, one of the challenges is just because we're so limited by the weather, <laughs> um, it's really hard to get the same kind of effort in the winter as you would in the summer. Like the number of field days that we'll actually have in the winter in comparison to the summer is quite different. So um, that's something else to take into consideration. It's just because we aren't necessarily seeing um, like the same number of whales. Uh, I mean, granted, yesterday we saw a lot. So, I mean, you know, they're definitely around. <laughs> um, but just because we aren't saying the same number or we don't happen to catch that one whale in that window that it was here doesn't mean that it wasn't here. Uh, so figuring out exactly, you know, when the whales are where is a, a big question, <laughs> which is part of why that collaboration is so useful. Because I mean, our team's pretty small, but when you have our eyes and the South Alaska eyes, and then also eyes in Hawaii, just trying to figure out like, oh, it was also seen on this day, then that really helps us kind of piece together where they were when. Uh, so, yeah. And on a longer time scale, I personally haven't been here that long to sh like really be able to give a lot of insight as to like what I've personally noticed about the changing migration over the years. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Wow, the questions are just coming in so fast and furiously today. It's excellent to see. Um, so in terms of, you know, trying to figure out where these whales might be and when, do you notice a time of day that they are most active? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, I mean, honestly, I feel like with that one, it would also be kind of hard because, you know, we don't really do a lot of photo identification at night. <laughs> um, it's, you know, safety, but also it's really hard to collect data. Uh, so that's, it's a little bit tricky to say a whole lot about what, like how much they're active in those nighttime hours or those hours that we're not really around. Um, I do remember getting some sightings and actually through the whale report app, there was a housekeeper that sent us a sighting that talked about how he could hear the whales um, like breathing near the lighthouse for like hours and hours and hours um, in like the middle of the night. And so like they are definitely around um, in the evening. I'm just not really sure what they do. <laughs> so perhaps 
But I mean, like the other thing too is that how the whales navigate underwater it's also still a little bit mysterious, right? Because we know that they can use sounds and that kind of stuff, but especially humpback whales, like they don't have the same echolocation abilities that whales like killer whales do, right? So how they navigate in that underwater environment is also very interesting. And what they do at night, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very, I have no idea kind of answer. Yeah, but <laughs> I love sparking curiosity. So that is always an answer that I, I applaud. Um, and so I think kind of in relation to, yeah, what are the, what is their behavior like at night or when you can't get out on the water? Um, we have questions about, do you use hydrophones and have you ever heard whale song before? Mm. Uh, so we do have a hydrophone. It's fun. We take it out on the water and we've used it a couple times. Um, and so we have listened to some humpbacks here. We don't have like one step specifically to listen for humpbacks. Um, but there's also, we have a C pod, which is kind of like a fancy kind of hydrophone that like records acoustic data. Um, but that's actually more for the porpoise research that's done at the North Coast Station Research Initiative. So we do a lot of porpoise acoustic monitoring through that. Um, and from what I understand, there are like other hydrophones up and down the coast as well. A lot of other groups that use hydrophones too. So hydrophone and listening to their acoustics is definitely something that's being done on the BC coast for sure. Um, and I personally, so one thing to note is that whale vocalization and whale song are two different things because whale song is a particular kind of vocalization, right? So I have heard whales vocalize before, which is cool hearing them make noises. There was one time um, we heard them vocalize and like we didn't even have the hydrophone down. They were just so loud <laughs> it was really cool. Um, uh, they're so fun and they make all kinds of different noises and. Um, at the surface, whales like humpbacks can also make this like trumpety sound with their with their vocal. They give this like and kind of that was a really bad example of it. It's not like that anyway. <laughs> kind of sound at the top too. So I've heard that. Um, but whale song only happens with humpbacks with the male whales and typically only in the breeding grounds. Um, so yeah, just wanted to clarify that. So I've heard vocalizations, but not song. Well, thank you. I think that's a great thing to keep in mind. And that's really exciting that you could hear vocalizations even without a hydrophone. Definitely on my uh, goals list <laughs> there. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the time just flew by, which really shows how much fun and how engaged everyone was in the program. I'm going to add the northcoast.ocean.org email into the chat for everyone one last time, as I know there were so many great questions that if you would like to connect to Julie, um, I know we always love to, to answer even more of them than we have time for in these programs. And so a big thank you, Julie, a big thank you to our audience today. Um, for anyone looking to connect with us next, as Julie mentioned, if you go to our YouTube page or I'll post the link to our gallery where all the recordings from the year can be found. Um, you can look up Life with Porpoise, which talks a lot about our hydrophone work um, with porpoises where Julie is with the North Coast team. Perfect. There we go. So you can always check that out. Um, we're, we are going to be having a very special presentation coming up next week with our OceanWise seafood team. And so, as Julie mentioned, a great way to take care of these animals is to be OceanWise. What does that look like? Well, making some changes and looking for the OceanWise Sustainable Choice logo is a great place to start. And so our seafood team is gonna be hosting a program at this same time next Thursday, December 17th to talk all about uh, Pacific salmon. So we hope to see you there for that very special program. And then we're off 
for the rest of 2020. And yes, 2020 is almost done. I don't know if anyone's as excited about that as I am. It's great to see Julie is excited too. Um, and so again, you can go to that education.ocean.org link in the chat and see all of our archived recordings. Go back, watch your favorite ones, or maybe some new ones that you haven't seen along the way. And of course, we'd love for you to stay in touch. We are going to be moving to a different a frequency of our tales from the deep insights from OceanWise research in 2021. Um, so please check out ocean.org slash learn online for our live stream calendar to see when our next programs are coming up. They'll all be there for you. You can always follow us at OceanWise EDU on Twitter to find the latest updates. And Julie shared the Instagram link for OceanWise research in the chat as well. If you'd like to follow them to see what's going on as we head into 2021. And so we really hope that all of you have a warm, safe, um, wonderful holiday season. And thank you so much for joining us and being with us throughout the year as well as today. Take care, everyone. <laughs>